Uh, we should be reminded of the great foundation that Paul has laid out in chapter 1. Uh, he's writing to the church in Rome, made up of Jewish people, God's, God's called out people, and also the Gentiles who were being grafted into the church. And so many of the New Testament churches were a mix of Jewish people and non-Jewish people as they were coming in. And Paul starts with his, uh, with his declaration, his coming in as a, as a servant of Christ, giving um, the uh, title of apostle, so we understand the authority by which he speaks. He opens this letter um, by just this warm welcome, looking forward to getting to Rome and being with the Christians that are there. But then he lays this foundation of, of revelation of what can be known. And it's a very um, important chapter, Romans 1, for us to study. In light of all that's taking place in the world today, we can always come back to the truth that we find in Romans 1 about the state of our world, the state of humanity, and where we are at. And Paul has laid this foundation that the gospel, that the righteous standard of God and justification through faith is going to be the theme that goes on throughout all of this letter. There's a flow as Paul works through this letter of Romans that builds upon the gospel, the righteousness of God and justification. But Paul speaks of revelation. And we have learned that uh, through, through studying Romans 1, that God has revealed himself to all people through creation and all that has been made. He says in verse 19 of chapter 1, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the beginning of the world. So revelation is God making himself known to us. And he has done this. As we see this world around us and we see the beauty of creation, we see the existence of God all around us. Now, there's more discussion of Revelation, though, because as we're talking about the gospel, what has been made known to us is that God has a righteous standard. God's righteousness has been revealed to us also. But in this revealing of God and his righteousness, what did we learn about humanity? What did we learn about the problem that all human beings have got is that we rebel against God's good ways. He has made us. He has made this world. But what have we done? We've turned aside from him. And the, the scripture declares that what we actually do is we suppress the truth about him. We, we have all this knowledge of God, this evidence that's been made known to us, but we suppress it. Why? Because we don't want to be accountable to him. We love our sin too much. We want to go our own way and be the Lord of our own life. And so as a result of this, we also learned that the wrath of God, this is coming from this righteous standard that God has, the wrath of God has also been revealed to us. Because what human beings have done is, rather than being devoted to God, the Creator, human beings have become devoted to the things that God made, or the things that we make. Or our jobs, or addictions, or whatever they might be, we become devoted to these lesser things rather than the God who created all goodness in the first place. And so, what God has actually done is He has let people go to their sins. He reveals this information to us that while people might think that they're free, I don't, I'm not accountable to God, I do my own thing, what has actually happened is they've become slaves to the very things that they lusted after. The very things that they desire rather than God, God has given them over to those things and they serve them. They are slaves to their own sins. And what Paul did then was as he got to the end of chapter 1, it was quite a confronting end of the chapter because he just lays out all of this sin. He just talks about from homosexuality right through to gossiping, from murder right through to human pride. He lays out this foundation of seeing that there is just so much sin that people have turned to rather than to God. And what Paul does now is he is turning towards anybody who might look upon that list of sins and then feel morally superior. He's turning towards the person who might think that they don't have any sin issues. That they might be happy pointing out the sins of every, everybody else, but not actually understanding that they're doing the same thing. Let's uh, just ask God to help us with these verses this morning. Father, we commit this time to you. 
Help us to be focused upon your word and what you're teaching us, God. Each of us has a role to play, Lord. Help me this morning to convey your word with clarity, what you want to say through the text. And help each one of us in the room, Lord, to, uh, to study the passage, to think this through for our lives, our families, and for our world around us, Lord. May we apply it to ourselves as we study it in the Word today. We need the help of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So as verse 1 says, Therefore, you have no excuses, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, you practice the very same thing. So that links us back to that massive list that we saw in, at the end of chapter 1. That, that's why the therefore is, is there, that's what it's there for. It's to bring us back to the passage that previously came. That this uh, massive amount of sins means that nobody is without excuse. As we looked and studied those ones, we were able to see that might, while we might have been out of stuff, see things in there that we weren't doing, we definitely came across stuff where we went, oh, I'm in that list as well. I didn't want to be in the list, but I was found in there as well. A question can be raised with this is that when we, when we study the scriptures, we should always be asking who is Paul actually talking to or who is the letter addressed to? And many will talk about this, that in those uh, previous passages of, of the list of sins, Paul was actually speaking to the Gentiles and the way that the Jews would have perceived those filthy Gentiles outside of the, the community of God as these ones committing all of the sins. And they will point to the reference to homosexuality because this was something that was more practiced in Gentile uh, world rather than the Jewish world. And so what they often say is that when Paul now turns to say, oh man, every one of you who judges, that this is really a, a looking towards the Jewish people who might feel that they were safe and secure as a Jew because they were one of God's people. Now I agree with that, but I would also add that I, I believe Paul leaves it broad enough that he is really getting everybody in this. Because he says, every one of you who condemns. Everybody who judges. And so there is a, a, a broad brush, I believe, that Paul is using when he talks about, therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man. Uh, it is not as though Paul is only calling out one particular group of people. Because the reality is, as we know from Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So here we are now studying uh, what Paul is saying and turning it around to take some examination of those who might be in this place of judging, not thinking that they don't have any sins. The question needs to be asked for us though, because of the modern culture that we live in, does this mean that all forms of judgment towards somebody else or judgments that we might make are wrong? Is all judging wrong? That no one should ever, ever judge. No, this is not the case. We have a biblical foundation of judging righteously. We are told to judge rightly. We are to examine the log in our own eye, yes. But often people stop there. They think that that scripture is basically saying that then you are not to ever go to your brother and talk about other issues. To talk about sin. Because if you study that scripture, you'll see that it then says, then after looking at the log in your own eye, then you would go to inspect the speck in your brother's eye. So you would actually still go to them, but have a look at yourself first. And we have a contemporary culture right now that loves to take two words out of the Bible, judge not, and then forget the rest of scripture. And it's really, really common in our, in our modern day to have people say, don't you judge me. Uh, Tupac, the, the, the rapper, said, only God can judge me. Well, that should really worry you. The reality of, of that statement should really actually cause concern. But this is not the case. And sadly, friends, many Christians in the evangelical world do exactly the same things the culture does. They say, calling someone... Uh, calling someone out on sin is not okay. That's too judgmental. But see, here's what you've just done by that very statement. The minute that you've said that's too judgmental, that was you judging somebody's judging. You've just been the judge of their judging. You can't escape it. 
You're making judgments upon the sermon right now. Is this making any sense? Is this even any good? Are you judging me? You should be. You should be judging rightly that I would be conveying the word of God to you correctly. So we can't escape judging. But the good thing about this text today is Paul gives the reason why he's called out judging and condemning others. He says it here in the text. If you will just re return to it with me. He says, because you then go and practice the very same things. This is why he's questioning it. Not because all forms of judgment are wrong. He's bringing it up because these people are hypocrites. They call out somebody else and go and practice the very same things. And towards the Jewish reader, yes, these are people that were following the law of Moses. So they might hear this list of sins of the Gentiles, the pagans and these sinners... And they could well be thinking to themselves, this is not about me. This could be for the Jewish person that thinks they're fine because they're one of God's people. They might think, surely God will overlook my sins, won't he? And it can be for also for the Gentile who holds um, a high level of morals, moralistics like the Stoics or somebody like this, who would be thinking that they were in a better place morally than others. But he says, you practice the same stuff. You're a hypocrite. Let's continue with verse 2. He says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Paul is calling his readers to take seriously the fact that practicing sin will result and does result in God's judgment. Do you think that for some reason that practicing sins is not a problem? Do you think that you will escape God's judgment? The judgment of God that we talk about is uncomfortable, but if we really love people, we will talk about it. God will keep people accountable for their sins. And it's important to note here that everyone, every single person, faces the judgment of God. And it is a pastor's role to prepare people for the day of judgment. A pastor's role is, yes, to care for the flock, to, to help equip people for ministry and all of these things. But ultimately, I'm preparing you I am laboring in the pulpit and each week to prepare you for the day where you give an account for your life before God. It's a fight for your soul. It's a life spent that we would see souls saved and be with God for all of eternity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says this, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We must all appear. Matthew 12, 36 says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word that they speak. The judgment will hide none of our secrets. The judgment will hide none of our actions and our inactions and none of our words will be kept in the dark. All will come to the light. And people think that this won't apply to them, going about their lives thinking, no, I'll be fine. I'll, I'll figure out another way to get out of this day coming. The, the writer R.C. Sproul writes about an American comedian named W.C. Fields. Some of you know W.C. Excellent. <laughs> Who died in the 1940s. Some of you don't know. A friend came to see W.C. Fields when he was on his deathbed and he found him reading a Bible. Unusual behaviour for, for W.C. Fields, apparently. And the friend asked him, he said, why are you reading the Bible? And Fields replied, I'm looking for loopholes. I'm looking for a way out where I don't have to be accountable to God or I don't have to go through this judgement. He was looking for an escape from a holy and a righteous God, a righteous judge who judges all people. And we know that if we are truly in Christ, friends, we know this, we have an assurance. We know that in Christ we will not be condemned. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't take the judgment of God lightly. 
Our preaching and our explanations of salvation and the gospel must include the topic of judgment rather than just a Jesus loves you message. It's so important, friends. Contemporary Christianity just wants to say, love them into the kingdom. You can't cuddle people into salvation, friends. There is no amount of nice things that you can do that will just magically appear uh, someone turn up to be in the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not saying the kind deeds and good acts, they're all very important, absolutely. But it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that calls us to repent of our sins that everybody needs to hear. Amen. This is the preaching. This is the message that each one must come before. Do we, do we love them enough to tell them? Or is the thing that we value the most comfortable conversations? It's a confronting way to think of it, isn't it? When we think about our neighbours or our workmates, that maybe we value more what they think of us than whether or not they, they spend an eternity in hell. And the good thing about coming to the conversation of God's judgment is that it will drive us where we are supposed to go to the cross of Christ. It will drive us to the place where we need to call upon the Lord for salvation and be saved. It is then at the cross that we will truly understand what the love of Christ actually looks like. As he laid down his life for us. Seeing the debt that he paid for us. It is here that we will not just take Christ's death lightly. That we won't just take his grace and think lightly of it. Paul continues, verse 4. Or, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? He says this statement, do you presume? And this means, do you think lightly of the cross? Do you take it for granted? Do you think lightly of the riches of God's kindness? Which can also mean, actually, this do you presume. It can mean, do you think of God's grace and kindness with contempt that you would actually despise it by the way that you would then live? If there is sinful, hypocritical living where we practice the very same things, what do we think that these actions say about what we actually believe about God's kindness? We can say words about godliness, but our actions will always reveal our hearts. Our actions will always speak loud about what we are really convicted about. Friends, look at that word there that is forbearance. It's so, so great to be able to move a little bit slower with with verses because we have an opportunity to study important words, forbearance. Now, forbearance actually relates to God's wrath. And this is worth mentioning because I don't know how many of you just use forbearance in a casual conversation. Uh, I certainly don't. And so it's worth a minute just to have a look at this. A couple of you would, I know. For, forbearance. Forbearance teaches us about what God is like despite our rebellion against him. Because the word forbearance actually means holding back of his wrath. He is holding back his judgment upon us for a time. And this is the reason why when we sin, we are not dead. This is the reason why we commit sins and we return to sins and we're still breathing. It's because of God's forbearance where he has held back his wrath for a time. Rather than God punish and bring justice immediately when we sin, He has held it back, He's held back His wrath, so that we might come to salvation. He desires us to come to salvation. This should speak of what our God is like. We know that the wages of sin is death, right? But God in His forbearance has held back this righteous wrath for this time. And this then follows nicely onto the word patience. And when you think about God, do you think about Him as a patient God? I know I do. We can often reflect together about how patient God is with His coming. We see it in our own lives. 
Have you given God every reason to be done with you? I haven't. Time and time again, our sins are many. Our stubbornness is great. We read his word and then we go and do the opposite. But he remains faithful to us. May God's patience as we study things like this overwhelm us to see what great love he does have for us. The fact that he would bring judgment upon us and should bring judgment upon us immediately. May we not take for granted the love that he has for us. And may that spur us on to live pleasing lives before him because of these attributes that he has. And so this, of course, then is followed up with this statement that we have in the word, which is uh, that many would know. Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Isn't it a beautiful phrase? Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to, to repentance? I personally want to be a little careful when I come to this one to be inclined to uh, maybe sometimes have a, a shallow understanding or a way that I would make that too quickly about me rather than about God first. What I mean by that is sometimes in conversations about reaching other people and talking about sin, Somebody might quote that scripture to say, hey, remember though, it's God's kindness that leads to repentance. Now, while that is true, just remember, the scripture there isn't actually about us. It's about God and what He is actually like. Um, this this is, is really important for us to understand because it demonstrates again these wonderful attributes of God. Now, if you've got a New King James in front of you, you will actually see a different word. You will see goodness. And so as we examine it, we see there's, there's more meaning and more to understand it. This word comes from the Greek word, krestotes. And krestotes means kindness, but it also means goodness. So we could say, like the King James does, that the goodness of God will lead us to, to repentance. That's helpful as well, isn't it? Kindness, but also goodness. Because that's going to make us stand back and examine all of the good things that God has done. From the cross to the giving of creation, to relationships, to food, to everything that is, that is in our lives that is good. These things should lead us to repentance and aligning with God as our King. Goodness is helpful and kindness is a helpful way to understand it because it demonstrates these attributes and who He is. And He is these things in a general sense. These, uh, he is generous, He is good, He is merciful, He is kind. And there is grace that is experienced by all people. No matter whether you're a Christian or not, you are experiencing the goodness of God each and every day. You're breathing His air. You're enjoying the food that He has given. The relationships with the people that He has created. He has made all of this goodness known to us. And as a response, what do you think our response should be to a God who has given such goodness? What should our response be? It should be repentance for our sin, shouldn't it? It would be right to think, wow, this is God. Look what he's done at the cross. We want to align with this God. I want to get right with him as I examine all these wonderful things that he has actually done for us. But is that what human beings do? Is that what human beings do as they examine the goodness of God? Sadly, many humans despise it. And the Bible declares that people without Christ hate God. They despise and they rebel against His goodness. Or they think lightly of it. And what do they do? They continue on in their sin. Even Christians can get to this place of staying comfortably numb in their sins where they're just uh, continued on following after these sins and getting ourselves into a place where we should be questioning our salvation. Am I really okay? But experiencing God's kindness, His goodness, should bring us to repent of our sin. It should have us turning towards God rather than running away from Him. And this really does highlight this morning just how bad the sin problem is, doesn't it? I mean, when somebody, if you've upset somebody and their response to you was to do something kind for you, even though you would have expected them to do something awful back to you, but you did, they did something kind to you, that would probably, in most cases, soften your heart, wouldn't it? 
It would have you going, wow, I didn't deserve that. I want to I make it right with that person. And that should be our response to God. But sadly, we make light of his kindness and his goodness. And it's for this reason that Paul adds in the final verse that we've got here today, verse 5, because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Because of your hard heart, rather than life flourishing and experiencing God's kindness, people continue in sin and store, rather than storing up treasure in heaven, rather than living for the things that have eternal value. Instead, people are storing up wrath. And this is the state of one's heart. And when the Bible uses the word heart, it's not talking about uh, your heart that's pumping blood through your body. The way the Bible talks about the heart is the seat of our emotions. It's our innermost being. And that's scary to think that our innermost is hardened by our sin and our rebellion against God. And this word hardness or hard-hearted is also translated as stubbornness. And a person might look upon the sins of others, not seeing their own need for repentance as well. They may not see a need for God's kindness to lead them to repentance because of the stubbornness and hardness of their own heart. And this is why, friends, we need the gospel to be preached. Because this is the remedy for hard hearts. The word of God is the remedy for the hardest of hearts. It is sharper than a two-edged blade and it can pierce through. And it does pierce through. Because I am one who had the hard heart that was pierced through by the Word of God and by His goodness. Lord, may our hearts never be hard towards Your goodness and Your kindness. Okay, so what have we got here this morning? Paul has turned his attention to the one who judges and condemns, but then overlooks their own sin. They go and practice the same things. They think little of their sins, but they're very happy to point out and jeer at the sins of others. This includes the Jew who saw the privilege, placing God's poor ones, despising those filthy pagans around them. It could be the moralistic Gentile thinking highly of their standards. And it can be us today who fall into the trap of judging and thinking that we are beyond judgment ourselves. Thinking that we are righteous by our own doing, rather than only by declaring that we are only ever righteous because of Christ. That we are those who first and foremost would say, I need a Saviour. I need Jesus. And so a good biblical understanding is needed of this topic because it shouldn't be taken to say that Christians are never to judge rightly, That would be inconsistent with every way that we live. It would be inconsistent with the words of Jesus, the words of Paul who does call out sin and the need for repentance. Paul calls it out in the church. He confronts the idols of the day. But then he also tells us that he himself is the chief of sinners. So yes, he firmly and boldly calls out the sin problems that he sees around him. He calls out the idolatry, but he knows And he declares, I am the chief of sinners. And so it's right for Christians to confront the evils of our day as well. It is right for Christians to grow in boldness. Because we want to see this world change. We want to see the gospel advance. We want to see these things take place. So we should rightly make a stand upon things and call out the evils of our time. But that would never mean that we would overlook our own sins. And we would be hypocrites to run to the very same sins that we would be calling out. So this should bring us to this discussion then. Of what do you think of each of us as we return to our own sins? Are we thinking light of the grace that God has given us? Are we cheapening His grace by running back to our sins each and every time. Get into that place where at first we we struggled with those sins and, and felt bad about them, but then we persisted in them so much that we just became numb to it, blasé about it. And this is the type of wording that Paul has here to confront this type of thinking. 
where he says, Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you think so little of the cross that you're okay with running back to these sins and practicing them? Do you take them lightly? The Bible is really, really clear. And Jesus was very, very clear about repentance. Jesus himself said, repent or perish. Jesus said, repent or perish. This was at a time where people were coming to him and pointing out some things of others. And Jesus didn't even engage with that. He just said, likewise, unless you repent, you will perish. We learn of God's patience, not wanting you to perish. So I ask you today, if you have not come to the place of putting your trust in Jesus as Lord, and you've still got breath in your lungs today, you have not yet perished. And you can experience God's patience. Because you're here, you are alive, you have not yet perished. And repentance is a gift that is right here for you today. A wonderful, wonderful gift. Would you recognize His patience? Don't set it aside. Would you recognize God's goodness and patience towards you? And then come to Him for the gift of life. Receive His forgiveness and every blessing that comes from being a child of God. Recognize God's goodness again today by bringing your mind to the place of the cross where Jesus died for the sins of His people. Jesus shed blood and died in the place of sinners so that we might be saved. This is good news for anybody who is in the room today, who, who is listening, who has not yet perished. You can think upon the resurrection today where Jesus actually demonstrated the power over this evil and over these sins. And think about his ascension where he now sits at the right hand of the Father where he is Jesus as Lord over all of this world, over every sphere, over every part of this world. And you can come to him today. Friend, why shouldn't these wonderful treasures be yours today? Why shouldn't they be for you as well? They are right before you. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. If you will turn to him. Christians, as we continue in our Christian living, I want to urge you as we come to a close this morning to embrace repentance as a necessary part of your Christian life. I want you to embrace repentance as the scriptures declare that God's kindness, His forbearance, His patience would bring you to a place of going, repentance is the right response to God's kindness and goodness. He requires that we aren't practicing the very same things that we would identify as being sins in others. And this might turn up in all different places in each one's life. For some, it's the sin of pride where you don't even think you've got a sin problem. For some, it is that kind of pride where you don't want to admit your sins. Most of your life looks pretty nice. And there's a lot of good that you do. But we have to believe the Bible that says all of us have sin problems. In fact, it says if you say you are without, without sin, you're a liar. It's not my words, that's the Bible's. For others, it's sexual immorality that exists in the church. It's sexual immorality where people want to follow God, but they still desire to chase after pornography and, and lust in this way. For others, it's a display of righteousness and godliness, but very happy to gossip about everybody else. There are so many things that the sin can look like in our life. So I want to just finish with some advice for embracing repentance in each of our lives. I want to urge you to build it into your life. Yes, we all struggle with hypocrisy, that's true. But that doesn't mean we should settle with it. We all struggle with sin, but it doesn't mean we get to a place of being okay with it. Remember firstly, fighting sin and hypocrisy in our life, it's a lifelong battle. Sorry to break it to you. It'd be great to say if we could have this wrapped up in a couple of weeks. 
and be on our way to perfection. <laughs> Embrace it now. Understand it's a lifelong battle. You are fighting against sin until the day you are glorified and you are with Christ. That's the first thing. It's a process of sanctification where what God is doing as you respond in repentance and following in His ways, He is making you more like Jesus. That's the aim for each of us. To grow as people who are getting more and more like Jesus Himself. So I want to say this. Talk to God about your sin often. Talk to God about your sin often. Repentance should be a regular part of our prayer life. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins. So it's scripture. God says confess them. Now we're not a Catholic church. We don't have a booth set up where a priest will sit there and listen to them and then you're all clear. This is a discipleship situation. All right, we confess our sins to God, but then we are to talk and confess our sins to one another. We have to bring it to each other and talk to other brothers and sisters about the problem that we have of sin. That's God's desire for us. In this process, there's an acknowledging that often we love our sin more than what we love God. Is that not true? We can say we love God, but then again, our actions show that we actually really do love these sins. Nobody put a gun to your head and made you gossip. Nobody forced you to click onto that pornography site. Nobody did this. We chose them because of our desires. So there's a recognition as we pray to God and as we talk this thing out, that we are seeking for those desires to change. Following Christ means that those desires will actually change. He will give us this new heart and then He will give us new desires. And it's a process where you will fall out of love with the desires for sin and you will fall in love with the things of God. As you study His Word, it will go from being, I just got to read a chapter because that's what I'm supposed to do as a Christian, to I have to get to the Word of God again. I remember Artie Ida saying to me one day, she said, I can't wait to wake up in the morning and hear what God has to tell me today. Isn't that beautiful? If that was our hearts for coming to God's Word, not just like, oh, I better get the Bible read. It's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. <laughs> to go to, I can't wait to get up and see what God's going to say to me this morning. And God will continue to change our desires. The sins will become more disgusting to us because our love for God is growing. Our love and our desire for Him will continue to grow. Don't conceal your sins, friends. Your sins will eat you up. You will suppress them, you will put them away, and they will eat you up. They have to come out. Because here's the thing, they are coming out one day anyway. Do it now. Do it now while you've got brothers and sisters to walk them through. Because God will bring all things to the light. Every word, every careless word spoken. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses, confesses and renounces them finds mercy. There is mercy for you. So talk to a trustworthy Christian. You confess them to God, you talk to God regularly about your sins, but get alongside a brother or a sister in Christ. And talk about your sins. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. That's what the Christian journey is supposed to look like. Not just turning up and saying to each other, God's good, high five, let's go back home. It's turning up and seeing how we are going with these things like sins. Seeing how we are actually going with our walk of faith as we get alongside each other. This is the life that God calls us to. This is discipleship. We need these things to be built into our lives. So friends, if you don't have someone like that in your life, speak to me. If you don't have someone like that, not only just speak to me, but have a look about at your relationship with your church friend, your church family. Because there are people in this room right now 
who if you said to them, brother or sister, I really need to just chat with somebody. I can really do with your prayers. They will get alongside you. They will get alongside you. They will love you. They will pray with you. And then you've got somebody that's going to check in on you and going, how are you going with that thing we prayed about last week? Yes, please keep praying with me. I, I, I want to keep going. I want to keep putting these sins to death in my life. Can you see the difference of playing church when we just turn up, but then we go home and we wrestle with these sins and we keep them there? And finally with this, the last piece of advice in regards to repentance and building this into your life is this. Always come back to the cross. Always come back to the cross and thank God for the cross. Including your prayers, thankfulness to God that those sins that you're confessing and talking about and dealing with, Jesus died for them on the cross. And say in your prayers things like, Lord, thank you that Jesus died for my gossiping. Lord, thank you that Jesus died for my hypocrisy. Lord, thank you that Jesus died for my sexual immorality or whatever it is, my pride and thinking that I don't have a sin problem. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus died at the cross for those very things. Because that will stop you from going away to a place of condemnation where I'm, not, I'm no good and, and I've got to just... And go into a miserable pity party place because then you are to get back up and continue to follow Jesus because those sins have been forgiven. And you are to follow him knowing that. Thank him for his forbearance. Thank him for his patience. Thank him for his kindness and his goodness. And think of this not just as an occasional prayer, but as something that's built into the regularity of our Christian lives. Friends, to finish, I want to to lead us in prayer, but I want to give you some space to just confess these things to God. As you think upon even just the past few weeks, there will be sins for all of us that we should be repenting of. I'd encourage you not to say them out loud. It's personal. I would encourage you to say them out loud to a Christian brother or sister who can pray with and walk this journey. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray firstly and then I'm going to have a moment where I'll be silent and I'm just going to ask you in your heart and your mind to pray and confess these things to God. And then, after you've confessed them, thank Him for the cross. Thank you for His kindness. Thank you for His forbearance. Let's pray together. Father, we're so, so grateful that Your Word continues to lead us to truth and freedom in Christ. Lord, it's not easy to confront sin. We know this. It's not easy to think upon the day of judgment that comes where accountability will take place. But Lord, we need this. It's in your scriptures, Lord. And Jesus proclaimed and called us. So we need to confront it, Father. So Father, forgive us of our sins. As we prayed this morning already in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins, Lord, as we forgive the sins of others. But Lord, in our prayer, may we truly be sorry for our sins. Help us that we would be those who not just relish and and love sins, but love your will and your way and your word more than those sins. Father, we repent. Christianity, but it's a uh, it's a daily, weekly part of our lives, Lord, where we bring these things to you, so that we would continue to change and grow. As we've confessed the Lord, we also want to do 
Thank you so much for the cross, Lord. We want to just thank you so much, Lord, that Jesus gave up his life in our place. That he died a sinner's death, Lord, that we might have life to be born again, to be children of God. Oh, Lord, may we not take this lightly, but may we celebrate the cross, Lord. May we see the worth of the cross in knowing what you have done for us, Lord. Father, we desire to grow as those not pointing out the sins of others and then practicing the same ones. Help us with our hypocrisy, Lord. And Lord, as we bring these things before you, and as we close this prayer today, may there be joy, true, genuine joy in our hearts, that although our sins were scarred, they are now white as snow. That these things that we have already confessed before you today, Lord, Jesus has already taken them upon himself. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we praise you, Lord, that we can get back up, that we can continue to follow Jesus boldly, courageously, joyfully in all of these things. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.